Presenting Bob Hope with Francis Langford and Jerry Colonna in Report from the Pacific on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company of Wilmington, Delaware, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Before we begin our play tonight, we want to tell you about DuPont Speed Easy Wall Finish, the new wall paint that you use right over wallpaper or most other interior wall surfaces. Although Speed Easy is an oil paint, you just thin it with water, then apply with a large brush or roller. In less than an hour, your walls are dry. For less than $3, you can refinish the average room. So for your fall home decoration, get Speed Easy. It's speedy, it's easy, and it's made by DuPont. Tonight, DuPont presents Report from the Pacific, starring Bob Hope, Francis Langford, and Jerry Colonna, the fifth in Cavalcade's new fall series of great stars in great radio plays. And now to raise the curtain on this evening's play, here is your Cavalcade commentator, Walter Houston. Good evening. You know, I have a very personal interest in tonight's show, but it concerns the profession of which I've been a member for many years profession which, in these long years of war, has become to our fighting men as important as medicine, as comforting as news from home. Tonight, the scene is somewhere in the South Pacific. A hundred or a thousand men sit before an improvised stage. Their faces show the strain of fatigue and exhaustion, the nerve-wracking effects of war. There's anticipation in the air. Then a figure appears. He walks casually to the front of the makeshift stage, he greets the men, he cracks a joke, then another, and another, and soon he notices the men no longer look tired. Their eyes light up. Their bodies, tense for days, become relaxed. That's the picture which Bob Hope saw time and time again on his tour of the South Pacific, when he, Francis Langford, and Jerry Colonna, and the rest of his troop entertained the servicemen on their 30,000-mile jaunt this summer. He found out what they thought, what they felt, what they would like the folks back home to know. In tonight's cavalcade, which makes me prouder than ever to be a member of the theatrical profession, Bob Hope makes this report of his tour to us. To every father, mother, brother, sister, wife, and sweetheart of the men overseas. Listen now to Bob Hope with Francis Langford and Jerry Colonna and report from the Pacific on the Cavalcade of America. <laughs> Hamilton Field, California, July 10th, 02-300. Tony Rom Romano, your passport, please. Thank you. Francis Langford. Here's mine. Jerry Colonna. Uh, do you have any, uh, do you have any means of identification? <coughs> Barney Dean. This is me. Patty Thomas. Yes, sir. Bob Hope. Is uh, this your passport? That's right. <laughs> you haven't traveled for a long time, have you? <laughs> Stick around, gang. We'll run into a straight man yet. <laughs> A few minutes before the takeoff, planes everywhere, men with sealed orders that'll take them to all parts of the earth. Little groups of pilots and co-pilots gathering in little cl clusters of friendship. The last cigarettes, the final handshakes, the parting remarks. I hope I draw Chung King. Second Louis there owes me 40 bucks. Hope I draw New Delhi. Hope I draw the islands. It's just my luck to draw Bob Hope. <laughs> I love that boy. Bob, the ground crew's ready to close up. Watch it, Mr. Hope. We've got to close the door now. I'm in, fellas. I'm in. But your nose is still outside, Mr. Hope. <laughs> Gee, Franny, we're leaving the USA. This is goodbye. And how proud you must be. Look out there. The Bob Hope Fan Club. Bob, you've got to lean out and thank your fan club. Yeah. Gee, thanks for coming down. So long. So long, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Swell a Crosby to see me off, wasn't it? <laughs> Pearl Harbor. Not one of us had ever been to Pearl Harbor before in our lives. I was here at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. I was on the Alabama. Hey, you're Slim Foster. Yeah, I'm Dallas, Texas. Of course, you wouldn't know it on account of lost my accent. I've been in dry dock ever since December 7th on account I picked up some Jap souvenirs in my back. We had a great week in the islands, didn't we, Slim? Yeah, Bob. We sure enjoyed that show you played to a quarter of a million us guys. 
And Bob, them ovations. Yeah, them ovations. Weren't they something? Mm, Louder than a bull calf born for his mother. I'll say. Yes, sir. Everywhere Bob Hope went, the cheering is absolutely deafening. We want Langford! We want Langford! We want Langford! <laughs> Next time I'll wear a sarong. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we'll bring Ben and Cabina. <laughs> Folks, I want you to get a load of a place called Christmas Island. It's north of the equator, about four or five degrees. It's a Turkish bath with mosquitoes and all over hot foot. One of the lousiest pieces of real estate on earth. Would you really like to know how bad this place is? Listen, General Colon is out there now talking to the new men. Men, I'll tell you about this island. Beware of poison snakes, scorpions, tarantulas, cockroaches, and blister bugs. Beware of the butterflies. Even their butter is poison. But above all... Men, above all, do not go swimming or wading. There are man-eating crabs here. Man-eating crabs? That's right. These crabs love nothing better than a good dish of man Louie. Oh, General. Yes, Louie. <laughs> Can I be assigned to Hollywood? I don't think I'm going to like it so well here. You have to be rock happy to like Christmas Island. Rock happy is when they catch you talking to the Goonie birds. But when the Goonie birds start talking back, you're a goner. Completely pineapple. Those boys were plenty lonesome for somebody from home. That same day before the show, the gang organized a ball game. Bob, we kind of thought Francis ought to pitch for one side and Patty Thomas for the other. You know, they ought to get a little exercise after that long plane trip. Yeah, I know what you mean, Jack. You mean you want the girls to be up close. Well, yeah, that's it. Well, where do you want me to play? Well, Bob, we thought maybe you'd be good in deep center field. <laughs> no kidding. Francis and Patty had more drawing power than the cards and the browns. I played seven innings before I realized that I was the only one that cared who won. Playing ball with guys who've been specializing in throwing hand grenades and seeing that back home again look come into their eyes. Well, you don't forget a ball game like that. And something happened on Esprito Santos that we're never forgetting. I'm Captain Andrews in New York, a medic here in Esprito Santos. Look at this wood. See that kid getting a plasma transfusion? Kid nothing. Look at him. He's 24. Out here you can be old at 24. Right now, Bob, Francis, Jerry, and Tony are standing around his bed. His name's Maury. He's from Brooklyn. Hiya, Maury. Hiya, Bob. Hey, what's that tube doing in your arm? Doc giving you the raspberry, huh? Yeah. Feels good, too. You remember Jerry Colony, Maury? Sure. Professor Colony. Big mustache. What's doing, Professor? Well, Maury, we're having a wonderful trip and needing lots of swell guys. Francis Langford's here, too. Hello, Maury. Can I hold your hand? Feels better in plasma. You've been singing, I bet, Franny. I'll say, Maury. We just gave a show here. I must have sung I'll Be Seeing You a hundred times. I'll be seeing you. All the old familiar places. A hundred times, huh? Well, Maury, I meant to say 101. Tony? I'll be seeing you in all This heart of mine embraces all day through in that small cafe, the park. Later that night, after the show, we were all sitting around taking it easy. <laughs> Hey, Doc. Come on in, Doc. All right, but she takes plenty of turn. Yeah, we're a little numb about now. Say, Bob, remember that kid you saw getting plasma? Yeah, what was his name again? Maury? Yeah, that's it, Maury. Yeah, he uh, died a few minutes ago. Yeah. This is Lieutenant Ben Reyes of San Francisco. The Hope Outfit picked me up at Guadalcanal, and I made the rest of the trip with them as an Army representative, photographer, and public relations man. Benny Ray's. What a guy, folks. <laughs> Lay off, Robert. Being a photographer, let me focus on a scene on Guadalcanal. An important decision is being made. Well, Hope, this is it. Colonna, what's wrong? I hate to say this, Hope, but we must have it out. Oh, but Jerry, we've been together for years. Nevertheless, we must have it out now or never. Have what out? Wisdom tooth, it's killing me. Bob takes Colonna to an army dentist in the jungle. 
Who else but a jungle dentist could get through the foliage in that upper lip? <laughs> Here's the professor in the chair, mouth open. The dentist pokes his hand inside and presses on the tooth. Uh, does it hurt when I do this, Mr. Colonna? No, oh, it's all right. Yeah, yeah, it is infected. Now, first a shot of Novocaine. Oh, then the pliers. I got a good firm grip on it. Now, here goes. Where the flying fishes play And the dawn comes up like thunder Ferguson of North Hollywood. Yeah, Fergie, I had to come to the South Pacific to find out that you live three blocks from me at home. Yeah. Mom runs the El Rancho School not far from your house, Bob. And here we are together in Australia. Mm. Say, look down there, Fergie. Those pine trees remind me of Oregon. How far out of Sydney are we, Fergie? Oh, about five hours, Bob. We're pretty far inland for a flying boat, aren't we? So what? Well, I like to be over water when I'm in a flying boat. It's a sissy in me, I guess. <laughs> that motor noise, what is it? Ain't in my contract, I can tell you that. What is it, Fergie? Busted gasoline line, Bob. Gotta shut off that one motor. One motor left? We're losing altitude already, Fergie. Go back and throw everything overboard. Throw everything overboard? Fergie, you don't mean... Not the people. Everything that weighs anything. Well, this is more serious than I thought. Okay, Fergie. Okay, boy. Hey, everybody. Start throwing stuff out and put on your May West. Barney, wake up. What's happened, Bob? One motor conked out. It's a forced landing. Strap yourselves in. Be right back. How about it, Fergie? Think we'll make it to the coast? We're losing altitude pretty fast, Bob. You think we'll make it to water okay? Hope it's deep water. Fergie, there's the coastline. Sure hope it's deep water. I'm going for it, Bob. Go back and strap yourself in. Where do you think I'd be going? Okay, Fergie, good luck, boy. He's going to make that patch of water. I'd give anything to know how deep it is. I'd give anything to be back in Vaudeville. <laughs> you know what, Hope? What, Barney? I've had about enough of this trip. <laughs> Here we go. Strapped in tight, Franny? Yeah. About that raise, Hope. Forget it. <laughs> you scared, Jerry? Frankly, no. You? I'm a liar, too. Hold tight, gang. This is it. Oh, boy. How about that? Oh, oh. Am I glad we're saved? Yeah, now, let me down. How about that, huh? That's setting it down, Fergie. Yeah, anybody got any plasma? They may take newsreels. Listening to Bob Hope, Francis Langford, and Jerry Colonna in Report from the Pacific on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by E.I. DuPont, the Nemours and Company of Wilmington, Delaware, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. I'm PFC Robert Bluewater from Depew, Oklahoma, the Uchi Indian tribe. I'm picking up this story, our story. The story of men who'd give six months' pay for one hour of laughs and songs from folks like Bob and Francis and Jerry and, and dancing like Patty Thomas gave us. Come with me to Noomphor Island, folks. Bob's announcing Patty right now. <laughs> yes, sir. This girl brings out the father in me. Fellas, Patty Thomas. Hello, Bob. Well, Patty, how do you like it here on lovely Noom Four Island? Oh. Well, anyway, Patty, they like lovely you on lovely Noom Four Island. But, fellas, here's Patty Thomas with her own version of Arthur Murray meeting Fred Astaire at the Hollywood Palladium. Oh. I'm glad to see so many of you fellas interested in tap dancing. How about that? A girl, huh? Yes, sir. Look at that. If this is what we're fighting for, get me a gun, boy. Get me a gun. <laughs> Thank you, Patty Thomas. And fellas, isn't it wonderful that Francis Langford and Patty can make the trip? I understand. 
I understand they're the first girls ever to land on Noom 4 Island. Yeah. Boy, won't Eleanor be mad, huh? <laughs> no kidding. It's great to be here with you fellas. I... Hey. Hey, what was that? I'd have sworn I heard a gunshot. Say, listen, if any of you guys want to make trouble, you know I'm not scared. Quit pushing. You want the whole foxhole yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Bob, what do you think? They shot a Jap only 1,200 yards from the stage. They shot a Jap 1,200 yards from the stage. Taxi, taxi! <laughs> I'm getting out of here. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who's nervous? Let's get on with the show. <laughs> Professor Colonna, what are you doing here? Well, Hope, I'm a union organizer for the plumbers' union, but I'm not doing so good. What's wrong? No plumbers? Worse than that, no plumbing. Oh, you How are you getting along here, Francis? Oh, wonderful, Bob. It's so thrilling after two years on your radio show to see men again. <laughs> hey, Francis, about my laundry. You know that stuff I've been living in the last couple of weeks? I know you've got a lot of influence for the boys. You take care of my laundry? Yes, Bob, I did exactly as you said. I gave your laundry to a Marine and said, this is Bob Hope's laundry. Please have it back immediately. What happened? The Marine opened it up, took one look at it, and said... I'm sorry, the difficult we do immediately, the impossible may take a little longer. Hey, Bob, how about some good old barbershop? Yeah. Yeah. The barbershop, that can only mean one thing. All right, here's our impression of a famous singing aggregation. the small type. Go ahead. <laughs> potatoes about as tall as the Empire State Building. Get me a piece of glass, throw it to my sergeant, and say, brother, unpeel them. <laughs> Remove those jackets instantaneously. If I only had my way. But here I am a private in the Army. I enlisted as a private. What the heck is private about it? And I can't sleep in the jungles. I dream all the time. Last night, I dreamed I was eating lifesavers all night. This morning when I woke up, all the buttons on my pajamas were gone. <laughs> Mayfield, a Red Cross girl from Minneapolis. A lull comes in the music, and soldiers and entertainers both, leading the hard Pacific life, sit around in little groups and talk. Just talk. Hey, you sang White Christmas swell tonight, Francis. Thanks, Bill. Is that one of your favorites? Yeah. Hey, you should, should have been with us this last Christmas, Randy. What a laugh. How come? <laughs> we were sweating our heads off. It's summer here at Christmas time. It's a white Christmas, all right. The sand was white, and the sun was white hot. <laughs> Did you happen to get a Christmas dinner? Yeah. We had Spam with trimming. Oh. <laughs> we even had a special bowl of Spam marked New England Plum Pudding. Oh. <laughs> and over in the corner of the barracks is Professor Colonna with a few of the boys. <laughs> Tell me, Jerry, is that a real mustache? Oh, no, no. This is the real one. <laughs> one I keep in my pocket. Well, how long have you had that mustache, Jerry? Well, I'm rather unusual, Gus. I was born with it. Oh, my old man's got a mustache, too. Only his is blonde. Oh, Dad's a great guy. He plays a hoe-down fiddle, but you gotta coax him. Boy, he loves that coaxing. Saturday night was our big night at home. 
Ma always baked a chocolate cake. We called it devil's food cake. I made the ice cream. Smashed the ice in a gunny sack, you know? Oh, yeah, then you put the rock salt around the ice, don't you, Gus? Yeah, and I turned that darn freezer till my arm was like to fall off. You know, Jerry, right before the cream freezes solid, that's when it's toughest, but you gotta keep going. Yeah, you gotta keep going. I wonder if I'll ever see Grand Forks again. Oh, quit kidding, Gus. You get back. Stop worrying. Down the muddy road, it's plenty late. But the boy with the tilted nose is going strong. Hey, and what makes you think nobody's got the Pacific War on their minds? Well, read the papers. What about this V.E. stuff, the big celebrations and junk? But, Wally, plenty of towns are planning on closing all the bars for the day, holding church services, and the factories are staying on the job. Naturally, people are going to feel like blowing their top on V.E. Day, but maybe it's a deeper feeling than we think, Wally. I sure hope so, Bob. Wally, don't worry. Half the American people will still have kids fighting over there. You know, Bob, I was just going to say that it's sure something to have you folks over here. Oh, skip it, Mike. I had to. Things were getting pretty hot for me at Paramount. (laughs) (laughs) Well, honestly, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw little Patty Thomas in that dancing costume. And Frances, looking like she'd just come out of the beauty parlor. Now, what's so hard for us guys to figure out is... uh, Well, you folks didn't have to come, but you did. Somewhere else I heard another kid make that remark. Yeah, it sure must be rough, Bob, finding all kinds of weather. Say, what's with you guys? You've dodged ack-ack over a bowel and been bombed and rained down, and you've caught malaria and eaten the same food month after month? You can't ring for orange juice in the morning paper down here in the jungle, you know. Sure, we're tired of flying, but we'll be home in a few weeks. You guys will still be here. Don't ever forget that. And say, we won't forget it either. Now that we're home, people keep saying, what was the one experience that topped everything else? What was the biggest thrill of all? It isn't a good question. Because the greatest experience in the world is to be with those kids of yours. To live with them, to laugh with them, to have chow with them, to cry inside when you see, instead of hearing secondhand what tremendous American citizens they really are. But we can name one moment that burned deeper into our memory than all the other moments, and here it is. It's twilight on a certain beach in the island of Tarawa. Imagine this, being here on Tarawa. And what a cute little outdoor theater this is. I wonder what the picture will be. Well, I'll look at anything but a road picture. I've heard Crosby's voice so often on the Army radio out here that I'll never look at a cheese sandwich again. (laughs) After all, sometimes I get moody and feel like Sinatra. (laughs) Hey, kids, here's the picture. The Battle of Tarawa. Holy smokes, the Battle of Tarawa, and we're on Tarawa. Look, the invasion boats. Ooh, look at that. Nearly all the first wave. We approach the island. Heavy machine gun and mortar fire take a heavy toll, boats and men. Still they come. That LST was caught just as it opened. Look at that boy trying to get up. We used hand grenades. All the firepower we have. Mortars, flamethrowers. How about those flamethrowers? How about those tanks? Tanks belch steel. You see them take steel in return, but you don't feel the awful concussion inside. The picture went on like that for 20 minutes. To the men, it must have seemed like 20 years. Our colors fly for the first time over Tarawa. We get a lump in our throat. We're mighty proud. What a picture. And what a theater. Sitting on this beach, all quiet now, and... Seeing it when it was a great big chunk of hell, well, it's almost too much for a woman to bear. You can include us men in that, too, Franny. Look over there to the right, and there's a graveyard. Once the battlefield in the picture. See the white crosses? How about that, huh? There lie the actors in the Battle of Tarawa. That was the last picture they made, and, brother, it was their best. Bob, Francis, Jerry, Barney, and Patty for the great work we've been doing and for the report you've just given us. 
Now, before I return to tell you of next week's Cavalcade star and play, here's Gain Whitman speaking for the DuPont Company with news about two DuPont dye processes that will mean more and better color fabrics for you after the war. Ever since the last war, when Americans realized with a shock that we had no dyes to speak of in this country and were dependent on Germany, DuPont has been in the forefront of the American dye industry. The DuPont Company has developed thousands of dyes, new and better methods of using them, and even when necessary, machines to make the new processes practical. This week, at the annual meeting of the American Association of Textile Chemists and Colorists, DuPont announced two new processes which promise you better colored fabrics after the war. The new DuPont processes make it practical to use VAT dyes, or fast dyes, as they are generally known, for many materials on which they could not be used successfully before. VAT dyeing is almost as old as civilization. The Tyrian purple of ancient Tyre, for instance, was a VAT dye. It was so poor, no one would use it today, but in those days, it cost the equivalent of $350 a pound. That's where the expression born to the purple comes in. You had to have a lot of money then to afford vat dyed fabrics. From that day to this, vat dyeing has been generally accepted as best. It's best because vat dyed colors are fast colors. They go right into the fibers and are locked there chemically, come rain or shine for the life of the garment. But vat dyeing has been difficult for technical reasons on woolen goods and fabrics made of mixed fibers. Most vat dyed fabrics have been cotton. The Army's cotton uniforms are vat dyed. That's why they stand rough treatment. These two new DuPont developments extend vat dyeing to other materials. One is simpler, more versatile, and more economical, doing in seconds what used to take minutes, and in some cases, hours. The other process minimizes the pulling and stretching that made it difficult to use that dyeing on delicate fabrics. Both of these improvements are being made available to the textile industry without cost as part of the DuPont Company's technical service. For you, after the war, they foreshadow brilliant, beautiful, lasting colors over a wide range of fabrics, not only cottons, but many other fabrics, colors that offer another example of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. Now here is Cavalcade's commentator, Walter Houston. Who was the girl Abe Lincoln loved? Was she the prettiest girl in town? The most talented? The most intelligent? Or was she just an ordinary girl who in her simple wisdom saw the greatness of the man she worshipped? Many plays have been written about Anne Rutledge. Many stories have been told about this girl whose untimely death left a scar upon Lincoln's soul. That never healed. But Norman Corwin, one of radio's most gifted writers, looked beyond the cloak of legend and saw Anne Rutledge as a warm human creature, no different from the rest, no wiser than most, but a girl who became immortal because she loved a man who was destined to immortality. I invite you to hear this story next week, The Girl Lincoln Loved, with the charming and talented Joan Fontaine as Anne Rutledge. <laughs> I repeat Walter Houston's invitation to join us next Monday when DuPont presents Joan Fontaine as Anne Rutledge in Norman Corwin's poignant story, The Girl Lincoln Loved. In following weeks, Cavalcade will bring you Clark Gable, Loretta Young, Charles Lawton, and many other great stars. Tonight's Cavalcade story was written by Glenn Wheaton. The musical score was composed and conducted by Robert Ombrister. Bob Hope appeared tonight through the courtesy of Pepsodent. This is Gain Whitman speaking for the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by E.I. DuPont in the Moors and Company of Wilmington, Delaware, and inviting you to be with us again next week. This is the National Broadcasting Company.